and you're listening to SAFM Literature here on SAFM. And first up, or first up in this hour, we're going to be talking about the Kaiskama Art Project, Restoring Hope and Livelihoods. It's a beautiful book. It's a labour of love, or the story of a labour of love and hope. It kind of tells the story of how a group of women in the settlement of Hamburg in the Eastern Cape have had their lives change, or have changed their own lives, through an exceptional project that's all about sewing. It's been written by Professor Brenda Schmarman. She is a South African Research Chair in South African Art and Visual Culture. She knows the project well, but she's also spent quite some time working with working around women artists. That definitely seems to be the focus of her interest. But she's in our Joburg studio. She can tell us all about it. Hi, Brenda. Hello, Nancy. Thanks Nancy. for having me on no, the show. No, it's an absolute, <laughs> absolute pleasure, and it's a joy to be looking at this book. And the Kais Karma Project is just such a warming project that's been going really for quite some time. Can you... For those who don't know anything at all about it, take us back to its origins. The project started in 2000. Um, I was actually living in the Eastern Cape um, when it had its first exhibition. It took some time to get started. It was when Carol Hofmeyer moved to the um, Eastern Cape from Johannesburg. And um, I saw their first exhibition at the National Arts Festival in 2002, the year I moved down there. So I watched them go through their development over the years. It's been going from strength to strength since then. It's one of those projects that seems to just get better and better yeah. and better. Yeah, and people respond to it and mm. the people working it just get better and better and better. Yeah. But just explain to us, because Carol's a doctor, you're mm. a researcher, mm. did, just, where, how did, and I think that Carol had an interest in embroidery, how did it all piece together? Well, well, Carol um, did. She started as a medical doctor, and then she did her masters in technology. Now, interestingly, she did that her MTech here at the University of Johannesburg, where I now work. Mm. Um, so there's a lovely link, my being here and doing the project, um, uh, writing the book from a Johannesburg context. Um, she she moved down there, and she wanted to start an, an art project. Um, she did so to try and help people develop their, well, livelihoods. Um, but she also got drawn into doing medical work at the same time. So she always balanced the two with each other for many years. She's recently gone back to art alone. So th so that's how she, she combined the two. Um, but she wanted to do what with which women? She she want, she moved to the little village of Hamburg, where really people had no form of income. Hamburg's a very complex area. It's a very difficult area. It was part of the former Siskai during the apartheid era. And even in a post-apartheid situation where people have got rights, they still haven't got an income. So she arrived here in this little place where she settled, um, discovered people really with the, just suffering from absolute poverty. Um, so she thought about introducing an art project, but she also wanted um, to enable people to have the opportunity to find, um, improve their lives through cr creative expression as well. So I think the project works in, in, in that way too. Yeah, so in I other words, it's not just that you make things to sell and you get money, but I think it's also that you have the opportunity to explore your histories, your environment, issues of concern to you through the creative practice. Yes, and the creative mm. process, wonderful as it is, it doesn't always work. I, I mean, I'm just reading your book and mm. I see that she originally started wanting to have a, have a group of women make things using old plastic bags, you know, yes. to sort of clean up the environment, <laughs> make something beautiful, make some money, make everybody happy. And of course, it didn't work, you no. know, because you couldn't use old plastic bags, you had new plastic bags, mm. which, yeah. so the whole thing went out of the window. Yeah. At what point was she inspired by the Bayer Tapestry? Because the Bayer Tapestry, just explain to us about the Bayer Tapestry, which, you know, has echoes uh, in the work of the Kaiser Karma Art Project. The Bayer, um, she saw the Bayer Tapestry, or she saw the copy of the Bayer Tapestry that's in Reading. There's a 19th century copy there on a trip to the UK late in 2003, I think it was. And, and the Bayer Tapestry, just to sort of spell it out, is, is a long... Will you, will you explain it to us? Yes, the Bayer Tapestry is... Um, it engages with the Norman conquest of England, and it, it's from the 11th century. We're not quite sure who made it, but we think the English women made it. So it, it talks about the effects of conquest and a group of women are believed to have sown the, this, the, this magnificent object. 
No, she she refers to it in the she, the the project made something that was really important was the Keys Comet Tapestry that was their first large work, which is now in Parliament, and um, the main thrust of the the Keys Comet Tapestry is the frontier wars of South Africa. So she took the idea of a work that was about the Norman conquest of England and spoke about the British conquest essentially of South Africa, and spoke about um, the the impact and effects of that. And it's it's a wonderful work which um, in, inverts and reworks a work from the West to give it South African import. And there were various other layers of meaning within it, for example. So she took some of the design elements that you find in the Bayo tapestry, like the zigzag around the um, or the form formation on the outside, um, the the border, and she turned it into something that approximates the c traditional or customary clothing worn um, by um, Isikosa speakers mm. in the Eastern Cape. So on that level as well. It, it, it was also something of a learning like, curve, not just for the women that she was working with, but for herself. I, I read somewhere in your book that mm. she said to somebody, did anybody know how to do a French knot? Yes. And so she, <laughs> you know, she was no embroiderer herself. I mean, this was learning for everybody. Yes, and I, I always think she's always brought in people as well with various forms of technical expertise. Um, to generate knowledge. And I think that's also one of the um, strengths of the project. So that, that coupled with each new work, it hasn't been a sort of regurgitation of the same thing. People have to look, taken on not only new content and subject matter, but also new techniques as well. And new pieces, you say, I mean, there's the democracy tapestry, there's the Rhodes University <coughs> excuse me, tapestry, there's the old, there's the, the Guernica or Guernica. Um, there have been many different tapestries. Mm. How does it happen? Do they get commissioned? No, not not usually. I mean, a couple of them have been, for example, that there was one done for Murray and Roberts, a lovely um, image of uh, object with tree featuring trees. But for the most part, the, if they're self-initiated and, and, and a buyer is found later, which is always a risk for the project, but but something that they've they've taken on because the works have have found homes. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll say it's a huge risk because mm -hmm. the amount of work, uh, the amount of woman hours that must go into these pieces is is unthinkable. Mm -hmm. I mean, the take for instance, is it Guernica or Guernica? I'm not sure how it's, but it, it's based on the Picasso painting. Mm -hmm. How long did that take to do? It's a huge piece. Most of their works are, um, take seem to take approximately about um, six months or so. To, to produce. And how many uh, w women working at one time? It'll vary from work to work, but there are just over 100 women or 100 people in the project. There are some men in the project as well, a um, handful of men. Um, so it, it depends on the nature of the work, but people work in, in groups on different sections in, in the embroidered pieces. So you'll find, depending on the size and the scale of the work, that there might be a, a dozen people w working on one section. They've got studios in Hamburg and also in the neighbouring village of Bodium, for example. They've got a, got a studio there. So it's, it's, it's in, they're in various parts and people might sew in, in a, a yeah. couple of groups. Yeah, so is it funded at all? Um, the, the project gets money, generates money through a trust, um, but, um, as you know, external funding. But it's it's always <laughs> needs money. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, the money is needed. So it's it's not as if it's um, this sort of lavish amount of money and it's an, an easy situation. Yeah. No. Completely. Mm -hmm. Just just going back to the actual sort of artworks mm -hmm. themselves. You know, and what you were saying right at the beginning, that mm. this is about having the women also tell their own stories about their own issues. And um, I think there is HIV, there's all sorts of mm. issues in there. That, that we're, and I mean, how appropriate we should be talking about this in the uh, 16 days of activism against um, violence against women. Mm. Lots and lots of issues. Uh, the women themselves, do they draw attention to these issues by doing the drawings or uh, are they given a theme? How does it work? Um, normally what happens in practice is that Carol comes up with an idea for one of the large works. But what's important, I think, for people to realize is that it's not a matter of then going and illustrating Carol's idea. Mm. It's always a very sort of loose idea. And other people come in and within the project and develop the idea, shift the idea, change it, bring their own experience to bear on it. So it becomes something that relates very strongly to 
a large group of people and involves a range of perceptions and experiences and understandings. The book has obviously taken you quite some time because you've been very involved in it with beautiful illustrations of all these pieces that can be seen. I suppose what I'm really thinking is what about the succession plan? Nobody lasts forever. Um, hopefully the embroideries will last forever, but, uh, you know, will the, are the sort of new people coming in, being trained up? Is Carol uh, busy training up anybody to take over from her? What, what does the future look like? I'm, I'm not sure what, um, from Carol and the leadership point of view from that perspective, but I can certainly say that one of the interesting things about the project is it involves people of different sorts of ages, so that um, young people are often drawn to, into it as well as more mature women. So it has a combination of people from different, different age groups, and you find people are joining at different moments, so it's not only the people who yeah. were there in 2000, it's in absorbed a range of people and there are always developmental opportunities um, that I've seen that people are being sent to different um, groups to learn different skills um, and when opportunities arise they tend to get shared as well they don't um, doesn't seem to be the same people just taking advantage of every opportunity there's a there's an uh, there's an attempt to spread the these around. Yeah. yeah. And the women, well, they're not just women, as you say, mm. there's a handful of men as well. The, mm. the, the people who mm. are in, involved in actually doing the work, did you speak to many of them to, to get their own stories of how it's affected their lives? Yes, I've spoken to people on quite a number of occasions over the years um, because I've been researching it over a period of time. Um, and, and yes, it's made a dramatic difference to, to people's lives. I mean, if you speak to people, you find out that people had no work at all and uh, then got employed as a domestic worker somewhere for two months and then came home and had no work. People had no opportunity for tertiary education, which the project has enabled. Some of the people in drawing have um, went to Walter Sassoon mm. University and got... Um, diplomas as well. So and, I, and I suppose it's elevated the, elevated the art of embroidery, really, hasn't it? Um, I think it has suggested or made very evident. I mean, their works incorporate quite a lot of techniques and there are media besides embroidery. But I think it has shown that embroidery can, in the tradition of the Bayo Tapestry, be used for very monumental types of works and not simply for pretty things that people produce um, just for recreational yeah, purposes. Yeah, that, that work in embroidery really does have impact. And what impact do you hope that the book itself will have, Brenda? I mean, is it, uh, is it hope that people might replicate this in some way or, you know, be inspired by it, do something similar? Um, I, th I think it's that. But I would also like uh, people to ha increase the knowledge and understanding of the Kiss Karma art project itself and what their work has done. Um, and I could, and uh, yeah, I think I think it's important that their work goes down as one of, in history, along with all the important art, South African artists who are have made their mark in South Africa. So I think that was more my concern than to sort of give a how-to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, no, yes, no, absolutely. Yeah, more to to say, hey, look what's happened here, and uh, and it's, what a very wonderful story it is too. Well, Brenda, thank you very much, and well done on putting it all together. It really is. It's a lovely book. It should be in um, in many many archives because it's uh, it's something exemplary, I would say. Thanks for your time. Very thank best you. of luck, and good luck to everybody in the project. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Take care. Yeah. Brenda Scumman, she is the South African Research Chair in South African Art and Visual Culture, talking about the, the, the Kies Karma or Kais Karma Art Project, Restoring Hope and Livelihoods. Very beautiful book, incidentally published by Print Matters.